Good evening. It's good to see you all tonight. It's good to be with you. I have thoroughly enjoyed myself so far this week. I, I want to say that uh, those who've been here for every service up to this point, um, I've got some very gracious feedback on the lessons. Overall, I would say it's positive, but there was, there's been a few remarks that have been something along the lines of, those were deep lessons. Those were deep. And I'm like, well, that usually means it was a little bit too wordy, um, a little bit too theological. And I don't mean that in an insulting way. Uh, sometimes I think too much and I don't, I don't parse my words well. And I apologize for that. But if the past lessons, especially last night, was a little bit too theological, a little bit too much of a deep subject, I think you'll like tonight's a little bit better. Uh, not that it's shallow. It's just that it's more familiar. And let me say this, if, if the lessons before this have felt that way to you, kind of deep, I challenge you to dig in. It's not that it's too hard. You can understand every bit of that. It's just not something perhaps you're familiar with. And that's what's so important about studying who God is, coming to know who he is. We worship him all the time, and we worship him, at least this congregation, I can say, confidently worships him in Scripture and in truth, according to the word of God as authorized in the pages of Scripture, but I want everybody here, when they assemble, to know who we are worshiping. Because the more we can know our God, and more we can know about how he's revealed himself in the pages of Scripture, the more closely we can approach him, the more fully we can worship him, and the more completely that we can love him. And so tonight, tonight we're going to talk about the power of God as in most cultures throughout human history, we, we highly value strength and power from ancient war heroes, uh, you know, like maybe the Hercules type, to, to, to the modern day professional athlete. We value strength and power. The strong are glorified while the weak tend to get forgotten. Now, I'm not saying that's good or bad. Maybe it is, maybe it's not. Maybe it's neither here nor there, but we are generally awed by feats of strength and those who possess great power. I can say I, I was too when I was younger, when my oldest, who you saw last night, who's 18, when he was a baby in a car seat, I was going to be a, a strong man. I wanted to be in strongman competitions. I, I'm pretty strong. Uh, I, I hurt my back and that ended my career early. Uh, but we, we always seem to value and are awed by strength and power. Perhaps this is why... God's power is more commonly taught as compared to, to the holiness of God like we talked about last night. See, we can relate to the attribute of power better than we can holiness because we see demonstrations of power in the natural world. We talked about that last night. I asked you to ask about things and, and picture something that is powerful. David and I had the same thing. We thought thund thunderstorms, lightning, right? And, and, and we can see things in the natural world or in our lives that are powerful but there's nothing that we can compare to that is holy. God alone is holy. And so, and so God's might and power, in fact, it's, it's so commonly discussed. It's one of the earliest lessons we teach our children in songs like, my God is so big, so strong and so mighty. Anybody ever learned that song? We teach about how big and strong. There we go, a hand, I like it. We teach about how strong God is, how powerful he is. Or if you're into singing vegetables, we, we have our kids listen to songs about God is bigger than the boogeyman and things like that. And, and so we teach our children about God's power. Now, there's no harm in communicating these thoughts to children and adults alike as long as we seek to have the right conception of God. Such includes him being all supreme. We discussed that Sunday. All sovereign, all knowing, never changing, immutable and alone holy, along with all-powerful. After all, if the Lord can know and declare a decree in his perfect holiness and sovereignty and wisdom, but lack the power to perform all his pleasure, then he cannot be God. Just as God has a will to resolve what he deems good, so he has the power to execute his will. So let's talk about the power of God. What is the scope of God's power? That sounds like an odd question, but I think it's worthy of consideration. The power of God is that ability and strength he possesses to bring to pass whatsoever he pleases, whatsoever his infinite 
wisdom may direct, and whatsoever the infinite purity of his will may resolve. So it's just very simply the power of God, his ability and strength to make, make reality what he desires and wills and thinks and decrees. See, we talked last night as holiness is the beauty of all of God's attributes. So power is that which gives life and action to all the perfections of the divine nature. I mean, how vain would be the eternal counsels of God, the decree of God, if power did not step in to execute that. God might decree that mankind be redeemed by his son being resurrected from the dead, but if he doesn't have the power to do that, then his decree means nothing and he is not God. So power is essential. Without power, his mercy would be just feeble pity. Without power, his promises would just be empty sounds. Without power, his threatenings are just a mere scarecrow. In fact, God's power is like himself. It is infinite. It is, it is eternal. His power is incomprehensible. His power can neither be checked, restrained, nor frustrated by the creature or anything created. Scripture simplifies the subject for us by recording that God hath spoken once. Now, this is an interesting passage, and I, I was told that the, the font's too small for people in the back rows. I'm sorry. Our screen's bigger back home, so the solution is get up and come up here. There's lots of seats up here. Sorry, I can't zoom. So come on up front. If you can't see, squint or move up front. Psalm 62 and verse 11 is such an interesting little verse, and it just simply says, God hath spoken once. I have heard it twice. Strength belongs to God. You know, we use idioms like, um, I've said my piece and counted the three. Or my personal favorite is, to quote Ernest E. Bass, I don't chew my cabbage twice. Right? We, we say things like that to make the point of the finality of our decrees. I've said my piece, counted the three. I'm not going to say it again. Parents say that kind of stuff all the time. God hath spoken once means nothing more is necessary. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but his word abides forever. God hath spoken once is so befitting his divine majesty. We, we poor mortals may speak often, yet fail to be heard. You ever feel that way? You feel like you're just saying things and nobody's hearing? God speaks but once. And the thunder of his power is heard on a thousand hills. Psalm 18, verse 13. The Lord also thundered in heaven. The most high God sounded his voice. Hailstones and fiery coals. He sent out arrows and scattered them. Shot out lightning and routed them. The channels of water appeared. The foundation of the world were exposed at your rebuke, O Lord. At the blast of breath from your nostrils. God hath spoken once shows his unchanging authority. God is immutable. His authority is immutable. It was declared and it was praised long ago. Here's a couple of verses, Psalm 89. You're welcome to turn to these. I, I put them on the screen for, for those who maybe uh, aren't as familiar back home with Scripture. We've got some new people who are visiting and I, I try to help them. I put more on the screen. Psalm 89 and verse 6 says, For who in the skies... Or the heavens can be compared with the Lord. Which of these gods can rival the Lord? All who live on earth are counted as nothing. He does what he wishes with the army of heaven. And with those living on earth, no one can hold back his hand or ask him, What are you doing? Daniel chapter 4 and verse 35. God hath spoken once. <coughs> and openly displayed when God became incarnate, Jesus Christ, and tabernacled among men. And by a word, by a word, he healed a leper. By a word, he raised the dead. He calmed the storm, drove out a legion of demons by his authoritative command. God hath spoken once. This, this is the awesome power of God. This is the scope of of the power of God to make a decree and be able to see it fulfilled. Now, 
God's power is not demonstrated in reaction. I do air quotes a lot. In reaction, we might say, to the, to the depravity and evil of humanity. I've had interesting conversations with people throughout the years, and, and they'll suggest things um, that, that God reacts to human evil. Right? God's power is demonstrated in accordance with his divine decree, with his eternal counsel, his will. In fact, I had somebody say one time, well, if God was real, if God was, if God was powerful, he would just stop all the evil with a single word, right? Let me say, he is all powerful and he will stop all evil, but not to satisfy us, not to satisfy some mortal. All that the Lord has decreed has been and will be. His hand never fails. Which, by the way, when you see the, 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 the symbol of the hand or arm of God, that's a symbol of power. His hand never fails. His will never falters. His decree shall always stand. And that, that is real power. The Bible is packed with such proofs of the incomparable power of of God. So I want us to consider how God's power is demonstrated just so we can see and really kind of get a grasp on the power of God. Because, yeah, we teach our kids that God is so powerful and so strong and so mighty. But let's take a look at how Scripture manifests and demonstrates God's power. One way is as his name, as the name of God. <clears throat> And when we talk about the name of God, and, and I've actually had some conversations with some of the members here about this recently, and, and, and it's an in, always an interesting conversation. The name, if you go back to the Hebrew concept of the name, the name is synonymous with the identity of, right? My name is Jim, but Jim is my identity, right? We understand that. And it has to do also with the reality, the essence of who God is. And there is power in the name of God because power is, is God's identity, his essence. Mark chapter 14, in verse 62, Jesus said, I am, such a powerful, powerful sentence. And if you have studied Exodus chapter 3, you know what he means when he says, I am. He says, and you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of power and coming with the clouds of heaven. Now, if you've never studied Daniel chapter 7, you don't understand what that verse is about. Jesus was claiming deity by saying, I am the cloud rider. Go back to Daniel 7 and study around about verse 13, and you'll understand why the Jews sought to kill him right after he said that. He said, I am, and you'll see me coming riding the clouds. Only God rides the clouds. The right hand of power, as he uses here in this phrase, you'll see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of power is synonymous with, or the same as the right hand of God, and God and power are so inseparable that they are reciprocated. And humanity can only know. Now here's, here's, here's where it's going to challenge your mind a little bit. With all that we can know of God, we can only know the fringe of his ways. Over in Job 26, if you were to turn there with me to Job 26 and verse 14. We're going to be in Job a good bit tonight, so if you wanted to put a, a marker in Job, that would be wise. That way you don't have to scramble for it every time we want to go back to Job. We'll, we'll be there a few different times. Job 26 and verse 14. And, and if you wanted to, you could back up and read the whole chapter and get the context, but he's talking about the things that God has done, the visible works of God in creation. The very thing that Brother Reynolds prayed about tonight, we can see God's hand, right? That's what Job's talking about. When you, when, you, when you see this, indeed, these visible works in creation, verse 14 says, are the mere edges, or maybe your Bible says fringes, of his ways. It's an interesting word in the Hebrew. It literally means like the edge of a, uh, of a quilt or a garment. It's the edge. And how small a whisper we hear of him. But the thunder of his power, who can understand? Do you hear what Job's saying? If you can look at everything God has done, it's just the very edge of his ways, the very edge, just a tiny bit of his power. All that is displayed of his might in the visible creation is utterly beyond our powers of comprehension. I love to study apologetics and read different things, and I, I always enjoy humanity's best effort, and I'm not making fun, 
Humanity's best effort to understand what God has done and try to have science explain stuff. It's always a little bit comical because all that is displayed of God's might is utterly beyond our power of comprehension. Still less are we able to conceive of omnipotence itself. When we see his power, we still can't, we are not able fully as human beings to fully conceive, entirely conceive of the concept of omnipotence, all power. There is infinitely more power lodged in the nature of God than is expressed in all his works. This is what scripture tells us. In fact, there's one chapter in the Bible. It's Habakkuk chapter 3. And, and I'm actually, I would like to read the whole chapter. I just think it's, it's one of my favorite chapters. In Habakkuk chapter 3, if you wanted to turn over there, you'll get a sense of this here. And, and just listen, <clears throat> if you'd like to, or you can turn and you can follow along. Habakkuk chapter 3, it's, it's a prayer of the prophet. He says, O Lord, I have heard your speech and was afraid. O Lord, revive your work in the midst of the years. In the midst of the years, make it known in wrath, remember mercy. God came from Taman, the Holy One, from Mount Paran. His glory covered the heavens, and, and the earth was, was full of His praise. His brightness was like the light. <clears throat> he had rays flashing from His hand, and there His power was hidden. Before Him went pestilence and never followed at His feet. He stood and measured the earth. He looked and startled the nations. And the everlasting mountains were scattered. The perpetual hills bowed. His ways are everlasting. I saw the tents of Kushan in affliction. The curtains of the land of, the land of Midian trembled. Oh, Lord, you were, were you displeased with the rivers? Was your anger against the rivers? Was your wrath against the seas that, rode, that you rode on your horses, your chariots of salvation? Your bow was made quite ready. Oaths were sworn over your arrows. You divided the earth with rivers. <laughs> the mountains saw you and trembled. The, the overflowing of the water passed by. The deep uttered its voice and lifted its hands on high. The sun and moon stood still in their habitation. At the light of your arrows they went. At the shining of your glittering spear. You marched through the land in indignation. You trampled the nations in anger. You went forth for the salvation of your people. For salvation with your anointed. You struck the head from the house of the wicked by laying bare the foundation to the neck. You thrust through with his own arrows, the head of his villages. And they came out like a whirlwind to scatter me. Their rejoicing was like feasting on the poor in secret. You walked through the sea with your horses, through the heap of great waters. When I heard, my body trembled. My lips quivered at the voice. Rottenness entered my bones, and I trembled in myself that I might rest in the day of trouble. When he comes up to the people, he will invade them with his troops. And then I love the last three verses. Though the fig tree may not blossom, nor fruit beyond the vines, though the labor of the olive may fail, and the fields yield no food, though the flock may be cut off from the fold, and there be no herd in the stalls, about as bad as it gets, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will join the God of my salvation. The Lord God is my strength. He will make my feet like deer's feet, and he will make me walk on my high hills. And I know that's a long reading, but it's a, it's a, it's a fantastic chapter. But he says here in this chapter, in these, in, in these verses, he says that the parts of his ways, the parts of God's ways that we can behold in creation, according to verse 4, the parts that we can see, the parts that we can behold in creation, in providence, in redemption, are only a fraction. Or, or my, uh, my translation says uh, it was hidden. It was still hidden. See, the prophet in vision beheld the mighty God scattering the hills and overturning the mountains, which one would think afforded an amazing demonstration of his power, but not according to verse 4. That is rather the concealing or the hiding, the displaying of his power. What, what does this all mean? What am I getting at? Because I'm talking about his name. What am I getting at? So inconceivable, so immense, so uncontrollable is the power of God that the fearful convulsions which he works in nature conceal more than they reveal of his infinite might. We would say that's just a drop in the bucket. I'll give you a few more proofs. You don't have to turn to them unless you just want to. Or maybe, you can't, maybe you can't read them. They're kind of tiny. Psalm 104, 
uh, Job 22 and Job 9. But look, Job 9 and verse 8 expresses God's uncontrollable power over the elements. It says, he alone spreads out the sky and walks on the waves and the sea. Job 22 and verse 14 tells of the immensity of God's presence. When it says the clouds veil him off so that he can't see, he just wanders around in heaven. Psalm 104 verse 3 signifies the amazing swiftness of his operations, saying you make the clouds your chariot, you ride on the wings of the wind. See, these expressions about God's essence, God's nature, God's name, if you will, are quite remarkable because he walks on the waters. He doesn't swim like a fish. He he traverses the heavens. He wanders across the heavens as only a supreme deity can. He rides upon the wind or the clouds. He doesn't fly as a bird. In all of these scriptures, in all of these words and phrases and and concepts, we see God is supreme. His very essence, the name of God, is powerful. And when we see He is supreme in power, just like His name declares, His name, Ehya, Esher, Ehya, I am that I am. God's name is how we see in Scripture His power demonstrated. But we also see it in creation. I've been all over this already in this lesson, and we understand this, that God alone is unlimited in creative power. A fun word for that is omnificence. I like that word, omnificence. It means He's all creative, unlimited in creative power. If you went over to Romans chapter 11, And notice with me verses 33 through 36. Romans chapter 11, verse 33. It says, Oh, the depths of the riches, both of the wisdom and the knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. Verse 34 says, For who has known the mind of the Lord or who has become his counselor? Rhetorical style questions Paul gives us. Or who has first given to him and it shall be repaid to him? For of him and through him and to him are all things, to whom be glory forever. Amen. Not a creature in the entire universe has an atom of power save what God has given to it. But God's power is not acquired. God's power does not depend on any recognition by any other authority. It simply belongs to him inherently. I I can't explain that. It just is. God's power is like himself, self-existent and self-sustained. That's true omnipotence. Not only does all creation bear witness, and I keep pointing out this window because there's some trees out there, not only does all creation bear witness to the great power of God, but also to his entire independency of all created things. Turn back to Job. Here's where that marker will come in handy. In Job chapter 38. Job 38 verse 4. Where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Now, for context, we know who's speaking. The Lord's speaking. Where were you, Job, when I laid the foundations of the earth? What a question. Tell me, if you have understanding, who determined his measurements? Surely you know. Or who stretched the line upon it? To, that, to what were its foundations, fast, foundations fastened? Or, or who laid its cornerstone? When the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy. There's so much in those few verses there, Job 38, verse 4 through 6. But what we see is all things, because he's self-existent, because God is self-sustained, all things are dependent upon him as creator and sustainer. But he is not dependent upon anything that was made. How completely is the pride of man laid in the dust? For we believe that somehow the Lord needs us. Want us? Desire us? Yes. Need us? Depend on us? No. That kind of hurts a little bit, doesn't it? He wants us. He loves us. He desires us. That's why he made humanity. He made us. But he doesn't need 
or depend on us. You know why? Because if he did, if God needed or depended, then his power would be limited. Listen to God's infallible word concerning his power in creation. Here's some scriptures for you. Genesis 1.1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. What a profound verse. Primeval matter heard his voice and obeyed. God brought order out of chaos. Psalm 33, verses 8 and 9. Let all the earth fear the Lord. Let all living in the world stand in awe of him. For he spoke, and there it was. He commanded, and there it stood. God simply spoke, and everything existed. Psalm 89, again, verse 8. O Lord, God of hosts, who is as mighty as you, O Lord? Your faithfulness surrounds you. You control the raging of the sea. When its waves rear up, you calm them. You crush Rahav like a carcass. That's a chaos beast of Old Testament. It's an interesting study. With your, he crushed it like a carcass. With your strong arm, you scattered your foes. The heavens are yours and the earth is yours. You founded the world and everything in it. You created the north and the south. Tabor and Hermon take joy in your name. Before man can work, for any of us can work, we must first both have tools and materials, right? But God began with nothing, and by his word alone, out of nothing, made all things. Well, may we exclaim with Ethan the Ezraite, there in Psalm 89, your arm is mighty. Your hand is strong. Your right hand is lifted high. Three times, symbols of power. Arm, hand, right hand. God is power and we see it in creation. I mean, can any of you go outside on a clear night, gaze into the heavens with all of its wonder and honestly think, oh, those are massive balls of gas burning millions of miles away that just randomly expo exploded into existence millions and billions of years ago. I mean, I suppose there are real people out there, I've met them, <laughs> who believe that the heavenly hosts were just produced without materials or with a very small, concentrated, tiny little bit of material that, that just the big bang and springing from emptiness, they just, there it was, all by itself. And then, and then actually I heard that the, the, the precise seeds for life somehow ended up on this rock that we call earth they proposed that maybe those little seeds of life hitched a ride on crystals that were deposited here by alien life that panspermia theory and at just the right time and at just the right place it produced you and me and then they'll mock us for our faith in the almighty brothers and sisters the created cosmos are a sure testimony to God's power. Everything exists by his good pleasure and by his spoken word. He alone is powerful to accomplish it. Consider also his power demonstrated in preservation. He made everything, but he also has the power to preserve it. Both man and beast would perish if the Lord were to withdraw his preserving hand. We don't have time, and I wouldn't dare do it with time tonight, but your homework, read Job chapter 38 and 39. Gold star for tomorrow night. Anybody who reads it comes in and gives me a book report. Okay, Job 38 30. Go read that, and you'll see. Not only did God make everything, but he preserves. He, he, he sustains. Therefore is God called the preserver of man and beast in Psalm 36 and verse 6. Your righteousness is like the mountains of God. Your judgments are like the great deep. You save or preserve man and beast, O Lord. God upholds all that exists by his powerful word. Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 3 says, This sun is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature and he upholds the universe by the word of his power. After making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. And in him was everything made and is still held together. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 14. It is through his son that we have redemption. That is, our sins have been forgiven. He is the visible image of the invisible God. 
He is supreme over all creation because in connection with him were created all things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones, lordships, rulers, or authorities. They have all been created through him and for him. He existed before all things. And listen, he holds everything together. He has the power to create and preserve. Just think of the marvel of God's power shown in the prenatal life of every human being. Think about a baby in its mother's womb. That infant, the, just think about the fact, now obviously we have science and technology and all this kind of wonderful stuff. Put your mind back hundreds of years and try to imagine what you would think about a child living in an environment with no light, no air, parent doesn't seem to have any food, doesn't have any room to move, right? It, it seems like a rather inhospitable environment to our senses, to the senses we're familiar with. Not breathing, right? Now we understand by science how that works. That's unaccountable without the power of God, even with science explaining it to us. Psalm 66, verse 9, actually Psalm 66, verses 8 and 9 says, Oh, bless our God you peoples, and make the voice of his praise to be heard who keeps our soul among the living and does not allow our feet to be moved. Truly, he preserves our life. What a, what a standing monument to the power of God is the preservation of the world, even our lives. But we also see, let me give you a couple more very quickly here. A really patient audience. I'm going to give you three more real quick. I'll move a little faster. It, we also see the power of God manifested, demonstrated in the limited activity of the adversary. Turn over to 1 Peter chapter 5. Here's a passage that's quite familiar probably to all of you. In 1 Peter chapter 5, we read over here, Be sober, be vigilant, because your enemy, the adversary, walks about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. We know that passage, but think about this. God's power is demonstrated in the limiting of the activity of the adversary, specifically in restraining the malice of the adversary. Brothers and sisters, the adversary is filled with hatred against God and mankind, specifically the holy ones, the saints, Christians. I mean, think back to he, he envied Adam in paradise and he envies us the pleasure of enjoying any of God's blessings. If Satan had his way, he would treat all of us the same as he treated Job. Now, I understand sometimes time and chance things happen, but if Satan had his way, he would destroy all of our families, homes, jobs, health. Wouldn't that give him such joy and pleasure to destroy God's people? But little as men realize it, God bridles him to a large extent preventing him from carrying out all of his desired evil designs and confines him within his ordination. Now, we don't often think about that, but that's a fact. Yahweh alone is powerful enough to accomplish that. Also, we see the power of God demonstrated in the natural corruption of men. Now, you need to think about this one for a second. God does su suffer sufficient outbreaks. He allows a certain amount of sin to show what fearful havoc has been wrought by the apostasy of mankind from, from the creator, from the maker, sufficient, but not unrestrained. I am not suggesting that God is the author of evil. We talked about that in a, a former lesson. But everything exists beneath that umbrella, if you will, of his supremacy. And so by his decretive power and negative action, evil can exist. Could you imagine the frightful lengths to which men would go were God to remove his curbing hand. Look at Romans chapter 3. Here's a very blunt, sobering passage. Romans chapter 3, verse 15. <clears throat> here we have a quote from, from Isaiah and, and Proverbs where Paul mushes them here into this little passage saying, their feet are swift to shed blood, destruction and misery are in the way. He's talking about, talking about humanity. Back up to verses 9 and 10. He says, and the way of peace they have not known. There, there is no fear of God before their eyes. Talking about the natural proclivity of humanity in apostasy, away from God. And to some extent, God 
limits. I mean, if, if everything humanity does is to shed blood and ruin and misery, then there would be nothing to stop it if it weren't for the power of God. This is the nature of every descendant of Adam. Can you imagine the unbridled licentiousness and evil that would triumph in the world if the power of God did not impose to lock down the floodgates of it? And you may not agree with what I'm saying, but you would be hard-pressed to explain it any other way. And then one more, very quickly. We see the power of God demonstrated in judgment. When the Lord judges, none can resist him. Ezekiel 22 and verse 14 says, Can your heart endure? Or can your hands remain strong? Right, Your strength remain in the days when I shall deal with you. I, the Lord, have spoken and will do it. In other words, God is saying, when I decide and I decree to judge, the biggest and baddest of mankind will turn into puddles of jelly. Nobody can stand. No strength. How, think about this. How terribly this was exemplified in the flood. Back in Genesis chapter 6. God opened the windows of heaven. He broke open the great foundations of the deep and accepting those in the ark, the entire human race, helpless before the storm of his wrath, was swept away. Who had strength to stand? Who had strength to stand in Genesis 11 when God decreed and scattered the nations and the languages there of Babel? Or what about the shower of fire and brimstone from heaven? as the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah were exterminated. There surely were some strong people in that powerful warriors. Pharaoh, doesn't get much more powerful than Pharaoh in his day, and all of his hosts were impotent when God blew upon them with the blast of his nostrils there at the Red Sea. It brings my mind to 2 Thessalonians <clears throat> chapter 1. In verse 6, <clears throat> speaking of these times yet future, it's a righteous thing with God to repay with tribulation those who trouble you and to give you who are troubled rest with us when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels. Verse 8, in flaming fire, taking vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. These shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power when he comes in that day to be glorified in his saints and to be admired among all those who believe because our testimony among you was believed. God is going to display his mighty power upon those who don't know him. It's that day of wrath Paul speaks about over in Romans 2. Those who don't listen to the good news and obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus, they are the ones his mighty power will be displayed against in flaming fire and vengeance. Well, may all tremble before such a God. To treat with exception one, the one, who can crush us more easily than we can a bug is a foolish, suicidal policy, spiritually speaking. Maybe actually literal. To openly defy him who is clothed with omnipotence is not a sign of wisdom or strength. It is an indication of foolishness and ignorance. Psalm chapter 2, verses 10 through 12. Therefore, kings, be wise. Be warned, you judges of the earth, Serve the Lord with fear. Rejoice, but with trembling. Kiss the son, lest he be angry and you perish along the way when suddenly his anger blazes. How blessed are all who take refuge in him. Well may the enlightened soul adore such a God. And only the enlightened soul can adore such a God. The wondrous perfections of God call for his fervent worship. These lessons are designed, in fact, if you don't feel that, then, then I pray that you'll meditate on this. As we come to know who he is, it demands 
our fervent worship of who he is. If men of might and men of renown can claim the admiration of the world, and they do it all the time, how much more should the power of the Almighty fill us with wonderment and homage? Exodus 15, verse 11, Who is like you, O Lord, among the mighty? Who is like you, sublime in holiness, awesome in praises, working wonders? Well, may the Christian trust such a God. This is our God. He is worthy. He is worthy of implicit confidence because nothing, nothing is too hard for him. God is all-powerful and unlimited in strength. And so we need not despair if we have put our hope and faith and trust in him if he is our refuge. What that means is that no prayer is too hard for him to answer if it is according to his will. No need is too great for him to supply. Again, according to his will. No passion too strong for him to subdue. No temptation too powerful for him to deliver us from. No misery too deep for him to relieve. Is the Lord the strength of your life? Psalm 27, verse 1. I just just love this verse. The Lord is my light and my salvation. With whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? Is the Lord the strength of your life? He's powerful enough. Have you made him the strength of your life? Is our faith like Paul's over in Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 20 where he says, Now to him who by his power working in us is able to do far beyond anything we can ask or imagine, to him be glory in the church and in the Jesus, uh, Messiah Jesus from generation to generation forever. Amen. The Lord is all-powerful and can do more than you or I can imagine. He can do more in our lives than than we can possibly begin to fathom if we will accept his invitation. I I like to put graphics up like this for those who have not yet become a child of God and been immersed for the remission of sins because it's so simple when you can see it in visual form. The gospel is is the, the facts that make up the narrative that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, died on the cross, was buried in the tomb, and was raised on the third day. That's the good news about Jesus. And we're told to obey, obey the facts, obey the gospel. How do you obey historical facts that Jesus died, buried, and was raised? I suggest you reenact it. When we reenact his death, burial, and resurrection, when we die to sin, we are buried in the water grave of baptism, and we're raised to walk in newness of life, we have obeyed the good news of Jesus Christ, his victory over death. That is his invitation that he extends. And I extend it to you now. Do you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God? And will you repent, turning from your sin, turning your heart back to God, confessing your faith in him as a Son of God, and be immersed for the remission of sins? That's his invitation. If you have any, any, any doubts about the power of God, the greatest demonstration was in Jesus Christ. In this graphic you see behind me on the wall. The invitation is to everybody, near and far. And if you need to respond, the perfect opportunity is right now, this very evening, before the sun sets, tonight. As we're going to sing, oh, oh, why not tonight? Why not? If you've not become a child of God, why not tonight? Because if you don't choose to do it tonight, then you must have a really good reason. Because that's the best choice. What's the good reason? What's the, what's the choice that you're choosing over the choice to become a child of God? That's a question for you to answer. But if you decide to put your faith in Jesus Christ, make your way down to the front. Let us know how we can help you. Together we stand to sing.